Howdy everybody, David Macon here, starting player with Connect More, and welcome to a very, very special edition of Avoid the Rules, a video of instruction and demonstration that helps ease rule understanding and learning. Easy start, and today we're going to talk about one of my favorites, Forbidden Island by Matt Leacock. Now, this is a very special edition of Avoid the Rules because I have recently taught this game at a special board game session at an elementary school here around Calgary, in Calgary area. And uh, I certainly hope that perhaps you are one of the parents of the children that I taught who have tuned in to come see what your child played at school, why it was important and educationally valid for this game to be actually be played at the school. And I also want to show you how the game is played and what the theme is and uh, how it all works together. I also want to take some time at the end of all of that to talk a little bit more about the different um, skills that were developed and reinforced during gameplay and uh, what we worked on with the kids while we were playing the games. And I also want to address the, uh, the elephant in the room, so to speak, is that we are playing a game and the main theme around the game is an island that is flooding or is sinking back into the ocean. We have done a few modifications to some of the game components, which I'll show you, to make the game less of a trigger, especially in a, in a uh, town that has been devastated by flooding this year. But some very careful thought has gone into the selection of this game, which I'm going to talk about at the end of the video overview. And uh, I really hope that you stay tuned for that, because I really think that this game is a valuable tool, and board games in general are a very valuable tool, especially for children, as a way to to communicate and to express themselves and to work together and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by this game and what modern board games have and what they can offer to uh, your family and to your children and so I'm very excited that you've taken the time to come and see what your child has learned in the, the classroom and I really hope that uh, this will be really enlightening and informative for you and if it is please drop by give me a comment send me an email I would love to continue to be engaged with the school and to continue using board games as very valuable tools and discussion points uh, for different activities that have gone, uh, events that have gone over the years. And I really, really welcome the opportunity to discuss board games in general with you, and more particular, Forbidden Island. Now, Forbidden Island is what's known as a cooperative game, and this is going to be different than a lot of other games of what you're expecting. We did a, a, a quick questionnaire of your children before I came in as to what types of games that they were familiar with and there were very common games like Monopoly and Yahtzee and these are types of games that generally are played person versus person so it would be me versus you and it pits people against people. What we call here a cooperative game is a game in which all of the players are going to work together as a team and this is an adventure cooperative game set in a very in a fantasy world forbidden island and you're trying to capture treasure and save treasure before the island basically disappears or sinks and uh, you need to capture these treasures and fly away and you and your entire team will win the game or the game will beat you and the team and so this is an excellent game especially in a school environment and even in a corporate environment where you can start working on team building skills you can are working on communication skills and uh, teamwork and problem solving within a group skills and by doing all of this it it's really important for you to have good communication and listening skills as well. So this type of game is extremely valuable, especially for what I call your tiny table toppers or younger children start learning these skills in, in an environment that is uh, non-confrontational, which some of these other games may or can be if it's me versus you and you have people who really want to win. Well, in the cooperative game, it is the collective effort of everybody working together that's going to determine the outcome or the success of your team. So I really hope that this game and will spark some interest. And if it does, again, please um, drop by my Facebook page, uh, find me on YouTube, uh, tell your principal that you enjoyed me and you enjoyed the interaction or the dialogue that this initiated with you and your child. Uh, please pass that on because I think it would be a great, great opportunity for other children to experience the same. So without much further ado, I present to you Forbidden Island, and please stay tuned at the end for some final thoughts. Thank you. 
Welcome to Forbidden Island, a cooperative adventure game in which one to four players or adventurers are going to work together as a team in a cooperative and collective way and try to rescue and find the four treasures that have been known to exist on Forbidden Island. And the four treasures that you and your team must find are the Earth Stone, the Ocean's Chalice, the Statue of the Wind, and last but not least, the Crystal of Fire. So you and your team of adventurers must come and land on Forbidden Island and use your skills and your team working skills together to find these treasures. And then once you have found all of these treasures, you need to rush over to Fool's Landing where the helicopter is sitting and waiting for you. And only then can you and your four discovered treasures and your entire team Fly away from Forbidden Island before it is claimed by the deep, dark, blue sea. But you have arrived just in the nick of time. Because as you can see, when the game starts, six of the island areas have already started to become submerged into the ocean. And the way you can tell this is, if you take a look at, for example, at any one of these tiles. Here we start with the Misty Marsh. It is just as it should be. But as the island continues to sink... You will flip that tile over and the island, this will become known as a flooded tile. And eventually the island will sink and disappear and Misty Marsh may disappear forever, leaving a spot of ocean there where the island once exi existed. The ocean is reclaiming what was once his. So you and your team of adventurers must move fast to discover and find these four hidden treasures and escape because time is ticking. That is the only way you and your team can beat the game. But there are four ways in which the game can beat you. The first way is the water is going to be constantly rising in the game. And this is a water level marker. And as you as the game goes on, there's going to be cards that you're going to be pulled called Waters Rise. And each time this marker goes up and up and up. And as it goes, eventually when you hit the red line, then it is too late. You have moved too slowly. You are stuck on Forbidden Island forever. Now, in the main game, there's usually a skull and crossbones that's right here. But I've been using this game for a, an example at the elementary school. So I've just put a little sticker over top of that just to, to keep that symbology out. So that is the first way you can lose if you don't make it to... If you don't get off the island before this water level meter makes it all the way to the top of the red line. The second way you can lose is, as you can tell, there are only two spots on the board for every tile, for every treasure where you can find the treasure. So for example, if you look at some of these tiles, you'll notice that there are going to be some icons in the lower left corner. These are the areas where you can actually go and claim the particular treasure. So for example, at the Coral Palace, that is one of two areas on all of Forbidden Island that you can claim the Ocean's Chalice. Similarly, the Cave of Shadows is one of only two areas where you can claim the Crystal of Fire. So if both of those areas should be submerged and sink into the deep dark sea. So here you can see is the second area where you can find the crystal of fire. Should you and your team lose both of those areas and not prevent them from sinking into the sea, then the game will be over because not only those areas will sink with the sea, but they'll sink with the crystal of fire, never to be found by you and your team again. So that's the second way. Should you ever lose the ability to ever capture one of the four treasures, you and your team have failed. The third way you can fail is if Fool's Landing disappears into the deep dark blue sea as well. Because Fool's Landing is the only flat area that is holding your helicopter on the entire island. And if this disappears, well that means your helicopter is sunk down with it as well. There's no escaping. So that is the third way you can lose. Now, the fourth and final way in which you and your team of adventurers can lose the game is if one of your adventurers should be find themselves on a tile that becomes lost to the ocean forever with no adjacent tiles nearby for him to swim to. So if your adventurer was on an island, was on a tile, something like this, and then suddenly due to an act within the game that the silver gate should disappear forever into the deep dark blue sea, you must be able to swim your adventure to one of uh, an adjacent tile 
And in this particular case, there is no adjacent tile. Now there are exceptions depending on if you have one of the special roles assigned to you, but this is the base case for the game. If you find that you cannot save one of your adventures and you and your team have lost the game. So although there's only one way to win, there are four ways to lose. So let's talk about how we can play this game and see if we can get our adventures to find the treasures and to escape the island in time. So now that we know how to win and all the ways that we can lose this game, let's talk about the different things you can do during your turns and how you're going to do them so that you might have an attempt at even winning this game. So here I've set up the game for a four player game with uh, all the roles except for the messenger and the navigator, but I'm still going to talk about them when I get to those points. And at the beginning of the game, like I mentioned before, there's going to be six parts of the island or six tiles that have been flipped over onto their blue hued or flooded side and these are parts of the island that are already in trouble. The ocean was already trying to reclaim them and the way we decided that was by shuffling here the flood deck here in blue and we just drew off the top six cards and they the flood deck has one card for each tile or each area of Forbidden Island on the board. So as you flip over the cards, you just flip, um, you just flip over the uh, appropriate tile. So we did that for six times. Then everybody was assigned a roll, and each roll has a color associated with it and uh, the same colored pawn. And what we did was once you get that roll, you go find the area on Forbidden Island that has a little colored pawn that matches your colored pawn on the bottom right hand side of the the tile and you put your pawn there. And the way I like to think of this essentially is your team is flying in by helicopter and you can see here the pilot actually is on Fool's Landing where he has landed the helicopter but as you're flying in and cruising over Forbidden Island the team is looking over Forbidden Island and is starting to get clues as to where these treasures might be and so they basically just pop out of their parachute saying right I'm going to drop here this is a big island it is sinking fast we got to get in there and get at these treasures no no time for all of us to go and land in a safe way on the helicopter. Let's just get out and start exploring. So that's essentially what represents is how I think of the start of this game. And as you're flying over, you're gathering clues as to where this information might be. And so each player will start with what's called two treasure cards. And the treasure deck here is represented by these orange cards over there. So beginning of the game, you're all dealt two of these cards. And majority of these cards are basically treasure cards. They correspond with the treasures that you're trying to find. And the way that you're going to win the game is by collecting a set of four of the same treasure cards and then moving your pawn to an appropriate tile that has that icon on it and then trading those cards in for that same treasure. So easy enough, right? So let's get started. So the first thing that you can do to try to achieve this goal is you can move because you're going to have to move around the island and uh, exchange information and, uh, and help rescue parts of the island as you're moving. So the movement action is very simple. You just can move to orthogonally adjacent tiles and each tile you move is counted as one action. Now, some of these special abilities that you've been given uh, give you special abilities and some exceptions to how you can move. So for example, the diver he can move through one or more adjacent flooded or missing tiles. So this is really quite powerful. So if the diver was say for example here, he could just on one movement action, he basically just snorkels all the way over to Misty Marsh. He's able to go through all of that. And even if the observatory was missing, no problem. He's just swimming right through. So he can, once his ability becomes extremely powerful when things start getting hard and tough and the island really starts sinking away. So that is the diver, his special ability for moving. The pilot also has a special ability when it comes to the movement action. For once per turn, he's basically able to fly to any tile that he wants to um, on his turn. So he's able to move very quickly from one side of the island to the next, well, because he's the pilot. The explorer also has some special benefits during the movement action. He's allowed to move diagonally, so he, he is not restricted to this motion. He can also go diagonally, but the explorer, he's got his big machete and he's an adventurous soul, so he's always looking for the shortcut and he can find them. So that's uh, the, uh, the movement, the explorer. And then also not being used in this particular setup, we also have the yellow navigator. And he's, during his turn, he's allowed to move other pawns up to two adjacent tiles for one action. So he's allowed to move another player. So 
If yellow was on here, during his turn, he could move black, one, two, if he wanted to. Or he could move green, one, two. Um, he could do that during his turn, just to help set things up if it is necessary to do that for the team. So that's the movement action. The second thing that you can do is you can do what's called shore up. And that's basically you're reclaiming Forbidden Island, you're saving parts of Forbidden Island so that it doesn't sink away completely right away. An example where you might want to do this, for example, you see Coral Palace. This is one of the places to actually save the, um, the ocean's chalice. So uh, the shore up action is very simple. It, all it does means is you just flip the tile over back to its original state. You've uh, restored that part of the island. And in order to shore up, you either need to be on the tile or again adjacent to the tile and you would respect the same uh, adjacency rules as if you were moving. So you got to be orthogonally adjacent. Except again for the explorer, again you could re remember he could move in a diagonal way. He can also shore up diagonally. So if the explorer was here, he could actually shore up this in a diagonal way. Oh, the other thing I should mention is the engineer. This is where his special ability comes in. He's allowed to shore up two tiles for one action instead of just one. So if you're the red engineer and you're here, for example, he could shore up the silver gate and the copper gate because they're both adjacent to him, but he's a smart lad and he knows, he knows his way uh, around these situations. He's well learned in this so he can uh, remediate the situation very fast. So that's the special ability of the engineer. So the third action that you can do is you can actually give a treasure card. And the way I think about treasure cards is these are basically, this represents your knowledge. This represents some clues that you found. Like you, maybe you found, a, who knows, a little, little chunk of paint of the statue of the wind along some tree. So you picked up some knowledge of that. Now in order to exchange that knowledge with the rest of your team, on Forbidden Island you actually have to be on the same tile to do that. So if the diver has information about, let's say for example here, the, um, the uh, um, crystal of fire, and we see that the pilot also has some information about the crystal of fire. Maybe when he's flying over, he saw something red gleaming in the forest. So he, he's got a little inclination as to where that might be. So if it's the, the pilot's turn, what the pilot could do is again, he can use a special ability that allows him to fly once per turn to anywhere on the, on the board. So he's done that, so he's flown, flown to the same spot as a diver for one action. Then for a second action, he's going to say, hey, I saw that, that some red crystal stuff gleaming in the, over there um, next to those cave, that cave area, the Cave of Shadows area. I think it's over there. I saw it when I was flying above. And so but that's basically the information he's given, and that's represented by the card. Now the diver has that card. So now the diver has two cards, and if he can collect two more, and it doesn't have to be him that collects them, it can be other people, and in the same way, they would go and they'd, they basically have a little, little cup of tea and, and exchange some stories and then that's represented by these cards. He's like, right, I got some more information about where I can find this. Until eventually he gets four of these um, similar cards and he goes to an appropriate tile where he could exchange that and he goes, woohoo, I've got the crystal of fire. Thanks for working together and sharing that information with me and choosing me to be the one to get the crystal of fire. The team is one step closer to their goal. So. And the other special ability that I'm not showing on the board, though, is the messenger. So when you it does come to exchanging this information, everybody else must be on the same tile as each other. Whereas the messenger can give a treasure card to somebody anywhere on the board. They don't have to be on the same tile for one action. So basically that means the messenger, he's good with uh, smoke signals or you know bird whistles, whatever it is, but he's sending you a message across the island that you understand and that's represented, then he would get, just give you the card so he doesn't have to be on the same spot as you. So it's essentially Forbidden Island email system. So, uh, so that is uh, giving information. Now the fourth and final action that you can do as I described is you can actually, as an action, claim a treasure. So suppose now that the diver has collected four of the crystal of fire cards, he can say, woohoo, I, I go to an appropriate tile, I cash in my cards, I throw them in the discard pile, which should be over here, and I uh, put them there, there'd be two more, and uh, I would claim the crystal of fire, and you'd put it somewhere here ready to, ready to go. And once you've claimed all four of these, then you run as fast as you can to Fool's Landing and take off before the island is lost forever. So those are the different actions you can do. So just as a recap, you can move, and again, uh, you always want to double check your special ability for each of these actions because they are important. 
and help you uh, navigate through the game a little bit easier. So you can move, you can shore up, you can exchange information, which is exchanging cards if you're on the same spot, again with exceptions, or you can claim a treasure. Those are the four things you do. And those are your four actions that you can do and you can take three actions in one turn. So now that your turn is done, there's going to be two things that you are going to do afterwards. And the first thing that you're going to do is you are going to draw treasure cards. And so you go to the treasure deck here and at the end of your turn, you always draw two cards. So you'll draw this card and you'll draw this card. So again, th this was the diver's turn, I guess. I'm flip-flopping here. But you draw these two cards. So you say, okay, guys, I'm starting to collect some information here. Um, you know, let's, let's figure out how we can get these treasures. Now, one thing I need to mention is in your hand of treasure cards, you could only ever have five treasure cards at any one time. So here the diver already has four treasure cards. And that's another really cool thing about this game because as you recall, you need four treasure cards to actually reclaim a treasure, to find a treasure. So you cannot be working on two treasures at the same time. It just won't work. Because as soon as you get that sixth treasure card, you're going to have to discard one. The maximum you can ever have at one time is five. So once you build up four of any one set, you're gonna have very limited space or wiggle room within your actual hand to be able to, to move. And I think that's just a really great dynamic because that encourages, again, team cooperation and team thought and team process to try to figure out, okay, right, I've got a lot, uh, a good amount of information here on two different treasures. I need to find somebody, and we as a team need to find somebody who could pick up some of this information and go find that one of these treasures instead of me because I cannot pursue both of these because if I do, I'm going to have to start discarding cards. And to me, I think it's kind of funny because basically you have the diver here, he's running around and he's gaining all this knowledge. And basically at some point in time, you know, as he's getting hot and humid and uh, running around the island and maybe perhaps a little bit dehydrated, he might slip and bonk his head and he starts losing information. He gets a little bit of amnesia. So he kind of loses information or kind of forgets or gets disoriented as to where he is on the island. And that information that he once has becomes useless. And that's how I think of, you know, the hand limit. And when you actually have to start discarding treasure cards, when you get over that hand limit. So it's a really neat, dynamic and really neat part of the game that helps force you to make decisions early on and to make them as a team and try to make those implement those decisions so that doesn't happen so you don't waste that time and energy you've already spent in acquiring this knowledge and acquiring these treasure cards you draw two treasure cards and then the island continues to flood. And what you do is you look here at your, your water level meter and there's going to be a number um, here in each of these different colored blue bands that gets darker as it goes up. Now, as whatever, wherever your water level indicator is in, that color, you draw as many flood cards as that number is. So right now we're starting off at the novice. And this is another way that you can actually start uh, the game. You can, for novice, you can start here and that's the easiest level, but you can start at very high levels where the intensity is already jacked and your heart's just beating in your throat and you and it's beating fast, beating fast, and uh, it's really intense right out of the gate. But here, we're gonna start with novice. So here, I, in this case, I would draw two cards. And so what you do is off the flood deck, you draw two cards. This is Brigger's Bridge. And I don't know if I feel very safe walking over a bridge that's held together with probably some old rope and called Breaker's Bridge. But uh, you flood that, and you will, will flood Gold Gate. So where is gold gate? Here's gold gate here, and you flood that. So you can see that the situation is starting to escalate. Now around and around we go, but within this uh, treasure deck card, remember you always draw two of these cards at the end of your turn, there are three cards called Waters Rise, and this is what they look like. There's three of them. And if you pull this card, the intensity starts to rise as well, not just the water. So the very first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take your water level meter and you're gonna bump it up one. And lucky for us, we're still, uh, when it comes time to drawing flood cards at the end of the turn, we're still only gonna draw two for now until the waters rise again. And then, then we gotta draw three flood cards at the end of each turn and then four and then finally five. And so you can see that the intensity will pick up. But the more importantly, uh, so that's the first thing with that. More importantly, is then we're gonna trash this card. You take your entire flood deck discard pile, you shuffle it up. And so now remember, these are cards that have already been flooded. These are parts of the island that are already in trouble. 
they've already they've already had you know they've already been wetted. You put that back on top of the flood deck. Oh no! Because now when it's time to actually draw these cards, even though I'm only drawing two cards, I'm drawing cards that have already been drawn. So you draw this card and ah! Fool's Landing! So if it's already uh, flooded like this, we should have shorted up, we should have paid attention to this because this disappears along with our helicopter. As you can remember, the way to win this game is you must have a helicopter to fly off the island so you don't sink with the island. So right there, in this example, we would have lost the game, but I really wasn't playing anyhow, so no big deal. But that is how the game goes. So you need to be able to protect what's important to you and keep them, because if I had to be shored this up, in, an, in a previous action, then if we would have redrawn the card, it just would have flooded again. So we still would have, you know, had a, a, a little breath. So you really need to concentrate on what's important, what you need to preserve. By all means, this is absolutely the most important tile you need to protect. The other treasure tiles, there's two of them, so you can kind of sacrifice one if you really need to. So that's the game. Uh, it's a, just a fantastic cooperative game, and I want to talk a little bit more detail about what educational aspects that were brought out of this game and encouraged during the time and show you the value that the game like this actually has inside the classroom and again why this game was chosen. So thank you very much for your time. Please stay tuned for my final thoughts. Well, welcome back. Thank you very much for making it this far. I really do appreciate your uh, your enthusiasm and I hope it's uh, the same as mine. I'm really excited to play this game. I'm really excited about having this game in the classroom. It was uh, with great pleasure that I was able to present this to a grade 2-3 class in the High River. And um, I want to take a second just to talk a little bit about um, how this game could be used as a catalyst or a discussion point to discuss the 2013 flood that occurred earlier this year. And at first glance, you may look at this game and go, you know what, this is a uh, game that involves flooding and the waters are rising. Those are some key trigger words perhaps for uh, uh, the children, especially now, who are still a little bit traumatized by that event that occurred earlier this year. And I want to assure you that a lot of very careful and considerate debate and discussion went into the choosing of this game and there was a few things that we tried to do when we taught this game. The first thing was, was we kept the language uh, simple instead of talking of flooding. And I know in my video review that I talk of flooding and these things. But I did that because it is a video review for the game in general. But for this particular instance, teaching it to uh, children who have actually gone through a very massive flooding event, we talk about the island disappearing. We talk about uh, areas of the island that uh, need to be flipped over, just basically the general mechanic of what it is. And the other nice thing about this game, we can actually start talking about geologic events. We can actually talk about things as such as Hawaii, uh, because Hawaii is a volcanic arc. And if you look at any, uh, and I'm a geophysicist by training, if you actually look at any satellite photo, you'll see that the older the Hawaiian island is, as the plate tectonics and the plates begin to slide over the hot spots, they begin to sink back into the ocean. And that's essentially what we're thinking of here. We can, and we know that plate tectonics and some of this geology stuff is actually being taught in the classroom. So we can actually even address that. We can talk about well, you know, you have these volcanic arcs and as the plates slide over these hot spots, eventually the islands will build up from the volcanoes and then they'll start to be reclaimed again by the ocean. But during that time, there were civilizations that existed and those civilizations have left behind treasure. And so it was packaged in this particular way to avoid saying, oh my goodness, it's flooding, it's flooding, everybody out, because we understood, we're uh, aware of the fact that that might trigger some very negative memories. That being said, is this game is also set in a very fantasy world. You saw the parts, you know, you have things like Breaker's Bridge and uh, uh, the Watchtower and, uh, and the art is very cartoony and uh, you're looking for treasures, they're neat, uh, they've got a toy-like quality to them. And so it is a, in a different world. And so we were hoping that by taking uh, a game like this that encouraged people to work on their communication because being a cooperative game, you're forced to uh, communicate with each other and develop a best strategy for how to move forward. So 
turn taking and patience were stressed because instead of having one person dominate until what everybody was done, it was also stressed that on your turn, you must propose a solution to the rest of the team. And only then can the rest of the team start discussing and debating what the best course of action will be. So we're able to really enforce the communication that um, will occur because although it's a cooperative game and everyone's working together, everyone on their turn has a, a, a chance to actually voice their opinion and to propose a solution and communicate effectively that idea to the rest of the team, whereas the rest of the team must listen to that idea, process it, and then counter-propose something. So that was uh, something that... Uh, um, the game really allows you to do with a cooperative game is to really work on communication styles and in doing so teamwork that's involved and good teamwork just comes from proper communication. And do all of this was centered towards problem solving because again everybody wanted to escape with the treasure. So the reason why I kind of digress and talk about all these skills because again if if this game was to be used as a catalyst or an actual discussion point for the actual flood that occurred in High River this year, I think it can be done in such a way that you can focus on all of the wonderful, wonderful human attributes that come out in times of crisis. We are talking about communication. We're talking about teamwork. We're talking about communities coming together in times of crisis. We're talking about problem solving. It's just short-term problem solving, how to get people out of flooded areas, and long-term problem solving as to how are we going to recover from the situation. And similarly in the game, you got short-term things that you have to deal with right away. Your, your helicopter pad might be flooded. You have to go over there and save it, or you might lose it and you lose the game. But meanwhile, you still got to keep the long-term goals of the game which is capturing all the treasures um, in mind and you need to keep pursuing those goals because time is ticking. So by doing this game we hope that it's just going to work on on uh, these different skills communication teamwork problem solving and also help your kids imagination and sense of adventure because you're on a team of adventurers and have a, an escape from reality because that's what games are for me they're an escape from reality but there is a realistic component in here that a child may pull from or even an adult may pull from to use as a catalyst for some real discussion if you want to about what happened in the floods earlier this year. So for all of these reasons we weighed both of these things we felt that this was going to be an extremely valuable game uh, for the kids to have a little escape from reality but should they choose to this might provide them the appropriate catalyst that they have been looking for to actually have a reality discussion with either you as a parent or a teacher or what have you. So I really wanted to to talk about that and let you know that there was some very careful consideration about the choice of this game. But I hope that by after seeing the game and having this discussion here or discussion with me that you can see that there's some very careful thought and I hope that the, the pros and the net benefit of, this, of bringing this game into the, the classroom uh, is been shown to you and presented to you and I really look forward to doing this again and perhaps this might help with other children in the in the in the school and be good for us to continue doing this with them so if it was please tell your principal please tell the teacher please give us some feedback and let us know if our thoughts and our ideas of what we we're trying to achieve worked because if it did that would be fantastic and positive reinforcement is the best reinforcement and I would really look forward to hearing your thoughts and uh, continuing to uh, bring board games into the classroom so that we can continue working on uh, some very educational um, skills and perhaps even using them to dig a little bit deeper in helping kids deal with some of the situations that they may have dealt with. So thank you very, very much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Again, my name is David Minkin, starting player with Connect More. I'm on Facebook, I'm on YouTube, I'm on Board Game Geek, and uh, board games are absolutely my life. And, uh, well, unfortunately, they're my evening and weekend life. And uh, it, I have three little tiny table toppers myself, a one-year-old, a two-year-old, and a three-year-old who absolutely adore playing board games for many of the same reasons that I've discussed in this video. So have a great day. I really enjoy getting to know your children and teaching this game to them at the school. And I hope that it has prompted some extremely beneficial discussion uh, amongst you and your child. So thank you very much.